I'm trying to unmute myself. myself and it's not working. Hmm. You have to enable your mic, Liz. Okay, okay, I just got it. Okay, yep. thank you. Hi, Kristen. I hope we haven't bored you to death with our <laughs> chit chat. Oh, you're you're so muted, Kristen. Okay, I'm I'm there now. No, it's okay, fine. Great. Thank you. It's all good. Okay, yeah. <clears throat> I'm very Please to introduce our tonight's speaker, Dr. Christian Sata. I'm going to have to uh, read his bio because it is very, uh, a little bit technical and very quite long. He's he's done a lot of stuff, and he's uh, <clears throat> anyway. His passion encompasses both eagle photography and astrophotography. His academic background is an electrical engineer and physicist. Particularly, his knowledge of optics and the physical properties of light has shaped his photography. It, <clears throat> his photography, excuse me. Oh, uniquely captures colors and patterns due to his keen sense of how objects reflect, refract, diffract, and transmit light. I don't even know what diffract means. <laughs> what does that mean? Never mind, let's leave it. Okay. <laughs> okay. He runs a popular Facebook and YouTube channel where he uses innovative techniques to bring wildlife and astronomy to his subscribers an experience that <clears throat> immerses his viewers into an active dialogue during his live events. Uh, he is now the astronomer in charge for Eye Telescope. In 2017 and 2018, his photography was featured in National Geographic articles on astrophotography and eagles and by Nikon USA. <clears throat> now, although, <clears throat> excuse me. Although Christian's uh, presentation tonight is on astrophotography and hummingbirds in slow motion, uh, he's a close friend of David Hancock's and sometimes accompanies him on trips and talks. So I wouldn't be surprised, surprised if there's a few eagle photos have sneaked into this presentation. I'm not sure. It'll be a surprise to me too. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Christian now. And I'm sure it will be a very entertaining and educational presentation. Uh, as usual, we'll deal with questions when the presentation is over. You can use the chat function to, put them, to record them if you wish. Um, and at the end of this meeting, we're going to have another little surprise for the members. So don't rush off after we finish with Christian's questions. Okay, Elizabeth, thank, thank, you. thank you very much. I, I hope you can hear me okay. Yes. Okay, good, good, good. Yeah, I recognize Kate here, so that's very nice to see her. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> very nice, good. Yeah, um, just jumping. So what I want to do is I want to jump across the universe and then right back into my my own garden. So everything that one can do with a camera and just uh, be curious about the world. That's really what I'm going to talk about. Uh, talking about South Africa, I just see uh, Thea, right? Is that right? Thea was in South Africa. I, I grew up in South Africa too. And I, I know Kate, of course, in, in, in Zimbabwe, right? So um, so there are some Southern, uh, Southern Africans here. <laughs> I actually grew up in, 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 on, in Pretoria, you know, part, part of my school life. I went to the same school as Elon Musk, believe it or not. <laughs> so that's rather funny. Huh? He only came a few years after me. Anyway, so that's good. I landed here in Canada and um, I'll just start sharing my screen and get going. I won't make it too long because I, I know, hang on. How do I share the screen on this one? Because I'm usually, let me just see how it's done on this one. Uh, da, dun, dun, dun. Can I, do I have the privilege to share the screen here? You should have. I mean, I can just check. I think you do. Because if I right click, let me see mute stop. I don't see the option at the moment. One second. Um, let's see, maybe there's some function is missing here. Sorry, let me just fork this one out. Uh, yeah, your sharing is enabled, so you should have a little green okay. button that says share. There should be a green button. Just hang on. Uh, you know, I've got so many screens open. That's probably the wrong one. Yes, and now I see it. <laughs> it's okay. Okay. Yeah, do you I see my you screen now? It. Yeah, you see it. Good. Okay. So let's start with some astrophotography because, um, you know, talk talking about the southern sky, it's the most beautiful one in the world. It doesn't compete with the northern sky, trust me. And um, if people in the southern sky have ever looked up, they will agree with me. And I'll, I'll tell you why. So the astrophotography that I'm going to show you comes from Australia. 
And I'm just going to open a PowerPoint. I really won't do PowerPoint, uh, death by PowerPoint here. So don't worry, okay? <laughs> I know how horrible it is, okay? So um, in 20, so I, I quit my job as an electrical engineer in 2016 and I went on my own. And um, I thought I'm going to do what I really enjoy. I'm just going to do whatever I feel like. And one of them was I wanted to start astrophotography. So I went to Australia with a camping van all on my own and um, started photographing the night sky. I always thought it was very interesting. I did that before I had a telescope and so on, but I never actually had the possibility, you know, to, to really experience the wild like this. And in, in, um, in Canada, it's extremely difficult to do that simply because of the weather, right? But in Australia, I mean, same goes for Chile or goes for South Africa or so on the Karoo and many other areas. Um, you know, you have a lot of good weather and it's just fantastic. So I just rented a camping van and I went out and I'd never seen kangaroos before. It was very interesting. And so at nighttime, I was set up my tripod in the middle of the road. You see that reflection here from the moon. There was nobody there in the park. You just set up your camera wherever you wanted to. And um, I heard these big thumps of kangaroos beside me. It's like big rabbits jumping around me. It's really fun, you know. So uh, that's that's how that's how I really started in astrophotography. And astrophotography is actually really simple. It's much easier than wildlife photography simply because everything's the same, right? If the weather is stable, everything's fairly easy. And I'll just um, explain to you just quickly why I'm saying that. And I promise you, I won't bore you too long with this. Let me just get out of this quickly and just explain why. Um, the reason is very simple. Let's see where my camera, yeah, here it is. Okay, that's all. Let me just expand this a little bit. So just a little bit about photography. So the earth rotates, right? Um, and at night you notice that. Uh, and um, if you start long exposures, it becomes really, really um, horrible because you get these star trails, which you don't actually want. And so what I have here is a simple picture. It shows you the focal length of a lens and how long your maximum exposure can be before you see star trails. That's it, right? So if you just put your camera on a tripod and you put it against the sky, it means with a 40 millimeter, where it's a very wide lens, you can expose for... 30 seconds and so on. And the longer the longer your focal length gets, 50 millimeters is like one to one to our eye, uh, the, short, the shorter it gets, so 10 seconds, and then it gets worse and worse, right? Because you're magnifying more and more. So that's the only thing you really have to know, right? And other than that, you put your eyes so quite high and um, you know you really go for it. It's 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 not difficult, right? So um, well, so. Of course, I also did star trails, but I find star trails really quite boring because you see them all the time and they really destroy everything. And if you look at the beautiful southern sky, that's our own galaxy we're looking at. That's the Milky Way, right? And this has taken over a few hours, shot by shot, right? You see this beautiful rotation and what you see there, uh, there are two smaller galaxies called the smaller, uh, the, the small Magellanic and the large Magellanic cloud, which you only see on the southern sky, by the way. But the why the southern sky is so beautiful is because uh, part of the southern sky is Sagittarius, and that's the center of our galaxy. You see it right on top in here in um, northern, you know, at 50, 49 degrees latitude where we are. It's just above the horizon it's not it's not and you can always see when some some photograph comes from north america because you can see it's not very high whilst in the south it's really beautiful high so what i'm saying in very simple terms is that a lot of spectacular uh, you know simple astrophotography is much easier in, in 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 the southern hemisphere than it is in the northern so that's anyway that's what it looks like during the night uh, when you do these exposures, right? And what is interesting then is what when I came back home, I superimposed, and this is really simple stuff. It's really simple to do, right? This is nothing special. Is I just superimposed these photos and saw that I got a beautiful pattern, as you can see. So all I did is just layer one over the other in Photoshop, or you can use any other software. And to my surprise, I got this pattern and I thought, wow, that's beautiful. This must have been done 10,000 times because it's so obvious to do, right? Um, and to my, so I 
sent this off in a, I put it on Twitter and at night and didn't think anything. I, I copied it to a person called Brian Cox, who's very well known. He's a, um, um, he's on BBC and he had been in Siding Spring in Australia where I was um, nearby that observatory um, a few weeks ago. So I just, um, you, you know, I, I, I just tagged him. The next morning when I woke up, my Twitter, Twitter account went completely crazy. He had redistributed a million times or whatever, you know, it was just crazy. And then the next thing I knew is, um, you know, <laughs> National Geographic co contacted me. Um, the New York Times contacted me, Nature, you know, the famous Nature magazine contacted me, everyone. I thought, this is crazy because it's so simple. And, and um, yeah, the Canadian TV came to my house and I thought this, they must all go bonkers because it's so simple, right? It's nothing really, but it's maybe nobody had ever done it like that before, right? And so, what surprised me is I come out from the outer field and this is something you can do here too. You can just, you know, take intervals in one hour intervals and then you superimpose them and you get pictures like that, right? That's a, what a 30 minute interval looks like. And you can do different things, right? 120. So you can do beautiful patterns and then you can do all kinds of animations and so on. And, and they really look quite artistic, right? So you can turn something that may look really boring to many people into quite something artistic. You can see here these beautiful colors there. Those, are, those come from the so-called Eta Carina Nebula um, that is very prominent in, in, in the Southern Hemisphere, much more prominent than, our, than the Orion Nebula or so is. So that's where all these patterns come from, right? Yeah, yeah, and so on and so on. <laughs> it gets very nice and you can superimpose them and make all kinds of nice graphs and so on. And uh, with that, I went for an exhibition in, um, I was invited to Singapore and, and uh, the same year and I gave an exhibition there. And then you can do these incredible things too. This is done with a fish eye, also superimposing again. And as you can see, it looks like a sphere actually. And I just maybe have to explain quickly where this pattern is coming from. Okay, so we are, the, the earth is rotating around, around the, the axis, right? I mean, you can see it when you look at the polar star here and the southern hemisphere, it's a bit more difficult because there's no obvious place to look at, uh, not as simple as it is here. And that's the rotation of the earth, right? So the center point is where the earth is rotating around. And then you can see, all these stars, galaxies, nebula, whatever, they have their rise and their set time just like our sun has. And that's, that's the pattern you're seeing here, right? And it just gives really beautiful pattern. And the illumination here is coming from the moon, the moon rise. Here you can see the moon rising in the morning, right? So you can do beautiful things. This is just one of many examples, you know, what, what, what you can do with that. That blinking comes from some cars or whatever. But... Um, it's, it's really simple. And then I worked with an artist together, a musician. I don't know if you can hear, it's probably a bit quiet. And um, she sort of, she, she composed <laughs> some music with this. And um, yeah, we gave this as a, you know, as a possibility to sort of somehow explain the, you know, have another look at the universe. That, that was the idea. Okay, so that's um, all I was going to, oops, let me just stop this thing. Wait a second, then now comes the problem of getting out of this thing, yeah. Hopefully I can do this. Let me just see, and show, yeah, there we go. Yeah, so as you can see, it's really simple, really simple to do, right? It's, um, it's, it's, it's no big deal. Maybe just to show you a bit of, about the beautiful area. Um, I don't know how many of you have been in Australia? Um, Okay, I see, okay, okay, I see quite a few hands, that's wonderful. Well, 
then <laughs> this will become familiar, look familiar to you. <laughs> I mean, no, no koala bear, no, you, I mean, I was surprised when I, you know, when I was with koala bear, how scruffy they are actually. I always thought they were very soft, but they're not, they're quite <laughs> scruffy. And what's interesting, by the way, about koala bears is they're very specific to what type of eucalyptus they feed on. So it's very local. I didn't know that either. So you can't just, you know, take a koala bear and put them into another environment because they won't be able to stomach a subspecies of, of uh, eucalyptus, right? So that anyway, that was quite interesting. Let me just see if I can find something else very quickly. Well, this is of course at the observatory. I, I flew a drone there, but you can see how beautiful that whole area is. That's the so-called Warren Bungle Park, National Park in New South Wales. And that's where I always go and I teach my astrophotography here. Um, and it's very unique because it's an, it's an old volcano and um, there's a lot of untouched wildlife there. Uh, it's, it's, it's quite remarkable, right? It's, it's, you can see how incredible, uh, you know, the, 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 the landscape here is. So I absolutely love this. You know, I, I love this sort of very harsh wild nature. It reminds me a bit of South Africa too, but, you know, parts of South Africa too. Okay, very quickly, just, um, I also, just talking about, about uh, astronomy very quickly, I went to the, with a friend of mine, to the 2017 solar eclipse. By the way, if you've never seen a solar eclipse, wow, you got to see it. Uh, you've got to see a solar eclipse. It's, it's absolutely stunning. Um, so that was a picture I took. I mean, that's really with a solar telescope. You can see that's the moon shadowing, um, of course, part of the sun here. You can see some of the, the sunspots here. You can see part of a solar flare and so on. And these are very, very nice things that you could do during a solar eclipse. I don't think my pictures are that great, but you know, they do show you, you can see some of the, um, let me just go in here, but you can see the beautiful corona here, of course, and, and some of the, um, uh, you, you know, of, 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 of the red emission lines from hydrogen. You can see that here, but it's just, really wonderful things that you can do. Okay, so let's jump out of this and jump to the next topic. And that's, well, I have to talk a little bit about eagles. Okay, so forgive me. <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to jump now to Dutch Harbor. Uh, you mentioned David Hancock before. Yeah, well, I mean, if there's anybody I learned a lot from, that's David Hancock. I, I try and stick with people where I can learn a lot from. And David Hancock is definitely the person you want to stick with uh, because he's so exceptionally knowledgeable. And I, I think I owe all my eagle enthusiasm and also my, my, my background to him. I did go on a trip in 2020 with him. To, I took him to Dutch Harbor, actually. The first time when I went to Dutch Harbor, and let me just explain to you what Dutch Harbor is about. Okay, so let me just open the map here. So where we are now suddenly um, is we're going to Alaska. Okay, you're going here to Alaska. You're going to Anchorage. I don't know if, how many of you have ever been to Anchorage or Alaska? Have you? Oh, good. Okay, great. Then you know. Well, when you fly a plane, well, you know the whole hazard that we have. Now the hazards are much worse. I haven't even tried it yet, but I will very soon. Now we have COVID tests and the rest. It's much worse than ever. But anyway, before we had all these, before it was only the, uh, the, uh, the, you know, the luggage check and all that. Well, the exciting thing is when you arrive in Anchorage and you want to fly to Dutch Harbor, which is on the Aleutian chain, the Aleutian Islands, the Aleutian Islands is a group of islands that stretches all the way to Russia, to Kamchatka, which is another area I would love to see one day because it it's, must be so magnificent with wildlife, right? Um, and um, it goes in the Bering Sea. And if you look very carefully, you can see down here is Hawaii and Dutch Harbor is west of Hawaii, which comes as a surprise. At least it came as a surprise the first time when I saw it, I wasn't aware of that. And the, the funny thing is that Dutch Harbor is on Alaskan time and Alaskan time is one hour behind our time. Whilst Hawaii, I think is two hours, if I, if I see it correct. This should actually be three hours behind, which means that in Dutch Harbor, the time is completely bonkers. It's crazy. It's completely crazy. So you wake up in the morning um, and it's something like, like um, uh, what, what is it? Uh, yeah, it's something like 8 a.m. or 9 a.m. or so. Uh, and 
um, you know, that it's very dark still and everything is mixed, completely mixed up. And then the day is very long because your time zone is completely out. It's one of these absurdities that, you know, instead of having common sense, we go by borders, right? Or by country. And that's the first thing that you'll notice when you're in Dutch Harbor. Well, the other thing that's interesting about Dutch Harbor is, is um, that when you fly there, there's no control, right? They just put your luggage on and um, it's, it's like being on a different planet. You don't think this is part of the States really, because I never knew it was possible even to fly in a, in a commercial airline without having luggage check. Yes, on, when you fly to Dutch Harbor, it's possible. And you, it's very interesting when you fly because you have all these incredibly sturdy fishermen on, <laughs> you know, on that flight with you. So it's a very different, it's a very different atmosphere, right? But it's very interesting, the Aleutian Islands, because um, if you look more at the geology, you can, you'll see that it's a very volcanic area. There are about, I think, about 40 sort of pseudo-active volcanoes along there. And then there's this very rich Bering Sea, which is to the north. And the Bering Sea is one of the richest fishing areas in the world. And that's why it is so incredibly uh, important. And of course, Alaska belonged to the United States before until 18, what was it, 1867, and was then sold, <laughs> was sold to the States. I think that was probably Russia's biggest mistake ever. But you will still see a lot of the, the, the you know, the, 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 um, the historical uh, landmarks of, of, of Russia in, in Dutch Harbor. So that's very interesting. So um, let's just give you a very quick picture of that. I don't know if I have it, but yeah, that's on the, no, no, that's not the one. Sorry, that was, I thought it was the Russian church. Where is the Russian church? I thought I had somewhere. Let's, let's start with this picture. Yeah, Dutch, uh, that's Dutch Harbor. It looks, it looks almost like nothing. There are about 4,000 people who live there, right? It's, it's very secluded and it's very difficult to get there. Sometimes it takes you days to get there because they have such strong prevailing winds from the north that hardly, uh, it's very difficult to land. So they have only sub 2000 machines that land there. And actually in, when was, I think in 2019, they had a plane crash. Fortunately it was, I was there in 2018, 2020 and 20, when was it 2016? I think yes, 2016, 18, 20. Yeah, that's right. So, um, so I never, yeah, I wasn't one of these plane crashes, but I can imagine how difficult it is, right? And that's all there is. There's a hotel, and there are a few things. There's very little there, and that's what makes it so exciting because it's completely a a fishing town, right? And it's very harsh, as you can see. I mean, this is. Uh, cars that you know it's just so salty from the um you know from 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 the winds there uh, uh you know that's not uncommon right um so you you your cars and everything quickly degrades as so much so that um this is also astounding right you see the u.s flag and you can see how how nice it is when nature prevails <laughs> over. Oh, it's very symbolic isn't it um, but the winds are just so strong, they tear everything apart. And of course, you know, we went there for the eagles um, because it's very interesting there. Um, there's a lot of fishing there and you can see what happens if they don't um, watch their fishing boats. They get completely invaded. And um, the eagles love this. Actually, this is a very good example of symbiosis between man and nature, the way things should, should be now because um, we have been so incredibly invasive in the way we build houses and everything that we are more and more displacing wildlife. So it is great to see a place like Dutch Harbor, where for many decades, this is especially I'm taking David Hancock's view here, who's studied such, you know, different parts of the world here. Um, it is very nice to see that, that it is possible for man and, you know, and, um, um, you know, in this case, wildlife to, or, or raptors to live together. And actually the, the eagles uh, migrate in January to March to Dutch Harbor from all kinds of different parts of the world 
not necessarily in this case because the salmon runs start there, but because they know now that there are there's a lot of fish there, and um, the fishermen are very relaxed about it. Okay, I mean they won't allow them to, to invade their boat completely, but they throw out a lot of fish, and it's very common for them to do that. But you'll find the same, by the way, in Hokkaido in in Japan, um, and it's probably you know one way of of helping wildlife to survive. What may surprise many is that it doesn't mean that the eagles become domesticated. They will never do that. They will always be wild. Um, you know, once they find an alternative, they go back the same as we see wildlife here and they will go and fish themselves or live on, you know, on, live on carcasses themselves. But it is very important um, for them to survive this way. And fortunately, at least as far as eagles are, are concerned, it seems like we are seeing, nobody knows for sure, but it seems like most raptors, we are actually seeing an increase in population, contrary to what we're seeing with all other birds where there's mainly a decrease um, in, in, in population, right? Um, how heavy the winds are is incredible. There's no, on, on Dutch Harbor, there are no trees, absolutely no trees. Uh, so the winds are incredibly harsh, and this is just a pair that is sitting there, which will soon be their nest, uh, their nesting area. So this is what makes it also very delicate, of course, that you have to be very respectful, you know, during the nesting period. Um, and actually, these eagles have learned to cope very well, uh, very well, because this nest uh, is another. This nest here is just above the post office, which they built there. And during the nesting season, they go and attack people. <laughs> the people actually leave the eagles alone, but it's, this is the reverse. They go and dive at people. I, I mean, I've had an eagle dive at me. It's not very funny, you know, because <laughs> they're big. And um, in Dutch Harbor, they make, gosh, they, they'll bully you away. And it's, it's, I think it's great to see that, you know. So um, it's, it's a bit the other way. And you know, they've made their mark and it's their only way of surviving. There are no trees, they can't hide in trees. So they've learned to, you know, to, to, to live that way. And it seems to go out. You will unfortunately see a lot of very exaggerated reports of people being attacked by eagles. That's nonsense. It's absolute nonsense. It doesn't, I mean, it's such a rare incident, but you know, it's just media hype. This is another crazy scene. I found this old sofa there and an eagle next to it. And the, you know, these are the type of scenes that you would see in Dutch Harbor, <laughs> which, really, <laughs> which really makes it makes it very interesting. The weather is completely unpredictable. There. It's, 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 it's really unpredictable um, because, uh, well, I mean, the winds change nonstop, right? But this is typical what you can also see that I went there with a fisherman actually, and he knows the area so well. Jack Molin is his name. He was captain of a fisherman. And um, I was very grateful. Again, I went with someone who knows things just very well. And I learned a lot from him because he studied the behavior of, of eagles for years and years with fishing boats and so on. And he knows uh, where, where to find them and how they behave. And it's very nice that you can just be on a, on a beach and they'll land next to you and they don't care about you. They care about the other eagles. They don't care about me or anybody, you know, as long as you just respect them and leave them alone, they are fine. And then what's also interesting, of course, or oh, not this picture, sorry, I didn't mean that one. I meant, uh, where is it? Let me just see one second. Did I miss it? Uh, some, oh yeah, here it is. Yeah, this is interesting. So this is also typical, right in front of the supermarket, they have a fish factory, right? And so they throw out fish and then you'll find cars driving by and you'll find eagles eating fish, right? And it's, it's quite remarkable. And you can virtually stand next to them. They don't care about you. They only care about their competition really. And that's the other eagles, right? So um, that's ve very typical for Dutch Harbor, right? Um, let's see what else I can show you, which is quite remarkable. Yeah, that was also on the beach, really interesting. I was, this is taken with my iPhone, believe it or not, right? Again, he doesn't care about me. He cares only about the, uh, about the other eagles. He's just watching out. Uh, he's got a fish there, obviously. And, um, 
Yeah, there's no one there. You're basically all on your own. It's quite, it's quite remarkable. Oh, you see, he's going there, but he's going to another. He's chasing someone else away. It's got nothing to do with me. Um, let's see what else I can show. Oh, yeah. Well, I went there, which was quite interesting. So, well, Dutch Harbor is also known for the deadliest catch, which I think is a bunch of garbage anyway. But pe people watch this type of thing. And that's the Cor uh, Cornelia Marie in the background. That's from the deadliest catch, by the way. It's a, it's a sort of a fictitious story about some drama on the sea, which by the way, never happens like that, because when you ask Jack Molden, who's a fisherman, he said that we would never behave the way they would on the boat because you would jeopardize, you know, the, the whole thing. They really are focused. They see that there's no conflict and so on. So it's, it's, it's very different. But that's typical what you find near a fishing boat. You'll find lots of eagles there and, and so on. Um, what I really got interested there was to do some slow motion. Um, let me see if I got any, yes, I do. Um, this is quite interesting. So that's an original here. I have a high-speed camera. And what's interesting is the high-speed camera is all manual control, but it's, this is running at about 1000 something frames per second. And so, so it's very beautiful because you can see what, what, what I love, seeing as the dynamics of flight, right? And you can see the, how the back feathers, how everything uh, works with an eagle. In real time, this is less than a second, right? And in slow motion, you're able to capture so many details. And in Dutch Harbor, you can do that. Of course, it takes some skill and patience, of course. It doesn't, I mean, this, this is one in, this, this type of video is pro probably, I get this once in a visit, in three visits, it's like so rare where everything is just perfect because it's very difficult to focus and everything, but it is possible to do slow motion videos like that. The most remarkable video I ever took, and I don't think I can ever take this again because I didn't even know what it has. So that is an adult sitting, um, sitting in a, in a, in a river or that, the, and that's a juvenile coming down. This whole thing takes about one, one second or less. Again, these are very typical uh, attacks juvenile coming from the top with its talons spread out, pushing, I, I didn't even know what I had there, uh, but it's quite remarkable. It looks very dramatic, but that's the way eagles behave, right? This is their, this is the way of socializing. I know it sounds crazy, but this is really how they socialize because two seconds later, they'll stand next to each other and um, they're fine, right? It's, it's, all, it's all good. So, they really have to watch out and they can't watch out everywhere. But what's interesting about eagles is they have, um, so they have two fovea, right? So they can, they have a, they, they have monocular and binocular vision. So usually when eagles are observing, they will eat and put their heads tilted because they have, their far vision is with one, you know, it's just monocular. So they have, they can watch with one eye in one direction and, and, and just, you know, watch out if there's any enemy coming from the top. And when they get close, they go to the binocular vision, right? And, and um, that's also where this very good eagle vision is coming from. It's, people say it's five to seven times better. I think it's complete nonsense. There's no way of comparing, um, you know, the, the, the the, the way an eagle can observe things with the way we observe things, because there's, there's simply no way, you know, there's no way of, of, of you know, of, of measuring that. But, you know, you get these incredibly beautiful sights everywhere, as you can see. Uh, it's just remarkable, of, you know, you just you stop somewhere with a car and you see these, you know, just a lot of eagles all alone. And where, where would you ever see that, right? So, there, well, I went there with David Hancock again in, in um, in 2020, just before COVID started. And um, David went there mainly to study the behavior, the group behavior of eagles. And my goodness, we discovered so many interesting things about eagles that we didn't, we simply didn't know. And I learned a lot from him because, you know, he, he just observes a lot. I mean, this is another quite remarkable picture. This is one eagle that fell into the harbor by just fighting about, right, fighting for fighting with food. But then you get these incredible pictures that you can take. I mean, where can you take something like that when an eagle, you know, leaves the water, right? It's just, 
it's just absolutely remarkable, um, you know, the studies that you can do. Okay, anyway, that's about, oh, that's, that, that's, um, that's Jack Molin, by the way, that's him. <laughs> and you can see that's an old eagle, by the way. It's lost one eye and um, it doesn't, you know, they don't care. They just sit there watching fishermen. And um, I actually had too big a lens with me because I couldn't focus <laughs> because it was so close. <laughs> I brought the wrong equipment, actually. You know? It's quite funny. Uh, next time I brought, um, you know, I brought different lenses with me, but it was really funny. Okay, so that's, I think, how are we doing with time? Yeah, are we doing okay? No. Um, so I'm going to show you one last thing, and that's from my own garden now. And then I think I've said enough. And that's what you can do in your own garden with hummingbirds. And again, you know, hummingbirds are absolutely fascinating. They are so fast, right? I mean, they're just so incredibly fast. They seem very delicate, but they're really quite bossy. So I don't know how many of you have hummingbird feeders. I'm sure a lot of you have, right? So you know, hey, they're very ter territorial. There's a lot going on. I thought, wow, what's really happening? I can't see anything. It's just so fast, right? Um, so, um, yeah, that's a, just another picture. Something's going on, and, and I, you know, you can't really see what's going on. So I, I thought, well, let's study this with my high-speed camera. This is right in front of the balcony. So what I did is I set up my high-speed camera here. I took a blower <laughs> to create some turbulence because I was fascinated. I could see that in the highest winds they could land. So I thought, well, what happens if I introduce a bit of turbulence there, you know, a bit of air and just see how do they cope? You know, what, what do they do? You know, either without causing any problems really, of course, you know, I had a strong lamp there and they very quickly become quite, um, you know, quite friendly with you and this is so beautiful because in you, you, you can see that's in turbulence by the way uh you, 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 what fascinates me is the the way they keep their heads completely still right that's not a coincidence right their heads are always completely level and it seems like they're floating on air their typical wing beats are somewhere between 50 and 70 beats per minute and you can also see how they use their tail feathers quite a lot. And very different, of course, to raptors. Their feet are very delicate when, when they sit down. They, they can hardly hold in the wind, you know? So they also hover a lot. And often people say, oh, they're not resting and so on. But with hummingbirds, it's different. I have done tests with hummingbirds where I gave them the option to either sit down and feed or, and I put a feeder where they would have to fly. And I saw that it, they choose the one or the other. It's, they have so much energy that it really doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter. There it's in turbulence, by the way, you can see, see how the wind is coming, but they cope very well in, in, in turbulence. It's absolutely remarkable, right? Uh, it's, uh, it's with such ease, you know, it's just, uh, just really beautiful. Um, <laughs> if you really want to see how good they can float in air, this is a good example. Um, uh, it looks like a racing car coming around the corner, right? <laughs> like, it looks like one of these comics. They're so funny. And they really slide. They break in the air. They really break in the air. This is something it's impossible to see with your eye because this is a fraction of the second, right? So if I, um, and then they just hover. But if I just show you that again, you know, this is typical, right? The way they come gliding, it's really... Um, you know, they're using their, 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 their obviously their, their back feathers for, for a full break, right? It's just incredible. Um, what I found most remarkable is their interaction with these irritating wasps. And it goes so fast that you can't see it. And this was probably one of the most remarkable um, footages I got simply because it's so difficult to focus. Those of you who know something about photography, it's very, very difficult if you're field of view is so shallow, most of my, my things are out of focus, but this one just happened to be in focus. This is really a fraction of a second, what you're going to see now. That should be happening any, any moment. So obviously this hummingbird is very aware that something's happening. Um, it really looks like, like they're float, uh, wait a minute. 
was it not this? Yeah, here it comes, here it comes, yeah. Just sitting down. And it's very aware, obviously, of, of, of that wasp coming and getting ready, completely focused straight on it. Now watch, this is all a fraction of a second. It's just insane, right? It's taking at 2,000 frames per second um, and basically floating around it. It's, it's facing it like this and turning around the wasp. It's absolutely phenomenal, right? If When you see something like that, um, I mean, this is what makes, you know, this, if you can do this in your own backyard, it's just incredible, right? And I want to do a lot more of this. Um, it's just crazy how fast they are, right? Um, yeah, one last thing I wanted to show you is how they drink. It's really fascinating, right? So um, this is just a very quick uh, clip, of course, of them coming to drink, right? And you can see how they're sucking there. It's about 12, yeah, 12 suctions per second. That's about the, the frequency here, right? And what actually happens is what I did is I, I got a cuvette of Amazon and that took me quite a long time and got very close. And look, you can see their bifurcated tongue coming in and out. It's really beautiful. So you can see how that actually works um, and it's you know to get this footage in your own backyard is is quite amazing it made me incredibly happy because it's very difficult to get right with the lights and well, for many many reasons it took a lot of patience to get this but what's interesting about their tongue is it's not just bifurcated at first one believed that oh that's about all on that one I think I have another one let's see if this one works um, yeah here here you see some more so the the way their tongues work is it's not what we thought initially is that they're sucking they're not they have very fine rolls on the tongue and they actually capture the fluid not by capillary but they capture the fluid by by with these small rolls and then they roll it in and then they, they this opens it's absolutely incredible what nature has you know has invented there so it's it's uh it's it's quite beautiful really so yeah that's maybe just a little bit of <laughs> background i think that's about enough now but i just um yeah thought that would give you a little bit of insight in what you can see in your garden so thank you very much thank you very very much christian you're welcome. So. That was really interesting. And you did have much more in the way in, on eagles than I expected. That <laughs> Sorry. <was lovely. laughs> that was lovely. That was really interesting. I'd, I'd never even heard of Dutch Harbor. And okay. uh, fascinating <laughs> to see the, uh, the fishermen sharing the fish with the eagles. And you had some great <laughs> shots there. And there's some lovely shots of the hummingbirds. Thank you. I thought it was kind of interesting that you met, um, met Brian Cox because I've been watching series on Knowledge Network, a number of them. Yes, yes, he's very good. Yeah, he is. And uh, he's, he's, you know, I don't understand 90% of what he's saying, but he's, but he's really fascinating to, uh, to listen to. Well, he doesn't understand 90% of it either because we understand very little of the universe. I can, I can <laughs> give you that. We actually know very little. That's well, all you know. Yeah, I mean, he really is uh, talking about um, a lot of very esoteric stuff <laughs> and only another physicist, I think, would understand it. <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's tough. Uh, everything nowadays, no matter where you put your knowledge also in biology, no matter what you read, you have to really get into it, right? So it's... <laughs> it is like that, yeah. Yeah. And there's a couple of comments here. Um, great presentation, Christian. Thank, oh, thank you. you. Thank you. Kate. It's a pleasure. And, and from Thea, our newest member, because that was so interesting and so beautiful. And from, oh, some, somebody else. I'm not sure who that is. Um, thank you. <laughs> uh, thanks for the amazing slow motion photography. Um, from Karen Topham, amazing astro and bird photos. Thank you for sharing. By the way, what is the name of the park in New South Wales? Oh, that's called Warrumbungo. Oh, I hope I get the spelling right. Let me just try. Warrumbungo. These are all these crazy names. I think it's spelled <laughs> Warrumbungo. I hope I got this right. <laughs> <clears throat> 
if you Google it, try it. it, it it'll, it'll correct it if I misspelled it. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure it will. <laughs> or on Bangal National Park, yes, that's the one. <laughs> Does anyone have question? Any more questions? Any of the photographers yeah. want to, to have Christian to share some wisdom? Jim <laughs> Ronbeck has a question. Yes, I'm curious as to how you accomplish the high-speed uh, photography. What kind of camera do you use? Yeah, one second. Let me see if I have it here. Just give me a second. Um, where is my high speed camera? Wait a second. I think I, I should have it somewhere here, actually. Let me see. Yes, it is here. Here it is. Let me let me see. If, can you see it? Yes. That's it. So this is a this is a Vancouver company, believe it or not. It's absolutely phenomenal. High speed cameras are are prohibitively expensive usually. They really are. Um, so this is a company called Cronus. I don't know if you could even read it, but it's Cronus, right? So, yeah. Okay. Probably very difficult to see that, Cronus, yeah. And they developed this camera here in Vancouver. It's, I was completely taken aback. Um, I think they came with their first model in 2017 and I bought it immediately. Um, it was about three or $4,000, which is very cheap for a... Um, US dollars, very cheap for a high-speed camera because high-speed cameras usually start at $30,000 upwards. It's completely out of my range. Uh, you know, no matter how much I would save, that's that's not on because technology develops so quickly. So that's what I did. So it's completely manual. It's industrial built. It's very boxy, like it looks a bit like a Volvo, but um, it has all kinds of things that you don't need. But the way, um, what's interesting, the way a high-speed camera works is very different to a normal camera. So once you focus and get all that right, which takes a bit of practice, but you can do it, you have a big screen here, it continuously takes, um, a takes uh, video, okay? So it's recording continuously in a six to 10 second interval. So whatever you take the last 10 seconds is recorded. So it's very convenient. When you take something, you only push the stop button right? You only push the stop button, which is very nice because in normal photography, you always stand there to get the right shot, right? Or you wouldn't even with a video. I'm sure Kate knows that, right? It's, wow, I missed that again because I, well, I didn't stop my video or whatever, right? But with a high-speed camera, it's different. It's running all the time. And then you just press the stop button and you just have to make sure you press your stop button on time that is within the last 10 seconds of whatever happens, right? So that's the way it works. Fantastic. Great, thank you. Question, if I may ask it. Yeah, sure. Um, I was wondering, your when you showed those neat pictures of the sort of the it looked like a it looked like Polaris with stars running around. Oh it. yes, yes, yes. What, what is the focal point there in the southern hemisphere that has like a Polaris type entity? Yeah, it's 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 there's no real star there. Um, it's you can you can find it with the Southern Cross. Um, extension same the same way when we use Big Dipper to find the polar star but you know we're just lucky there happens to be a star you know the the the, the north star the pole star that's right in the middle there in the opposite side there's nothing there and by the way in a few thousand years our polar star will have shifted and we'll have nothing there either you know? <laughs> it's just we're lucky that it is like that right now okay so okay <laughs> Did you see her hat? Yes. Yes. Cute. Where? Where? How do I get sound here? Where do you go stargazing in the BC? Oh, that's a great question. You know, last year we had this beautiful comet Neowise. You may know that. Oh, it was so wonderful. I went to Harrison Lake. I went to Harrison Lake. It's quite dark there, right? It depends, of course, what you're looking for. But with, a, with, the, um, uh, with Comet Neowise, um, it was very good because you need to look in the northern direction, right? It depends which direction you're looking at, right? So, uh, uh, so that's, if you want a good dark site that's not far away and not flooded, flooded, right? The moment you can't even get there. <laughs> so <laughs> I shouldn't even talk that. But if you take the cook, you know, if you if you take the um, the uh, highway one and you take the ag exit, what is it, Agassiz or or uh, um, Harrison Lake? Yes, um, that exit 
it's it's about an hour drive usually it's not not far right it's very dark there and and you can see the milky way really beautiful there so the other place of course is go to our go out to whistler uh, that's another place uh, where it gets very dark squamish i would go um but yeah so there you know direction of mountains is is a good is a is a good place yeah yeah thank you yeah sure i wonder if everyone's aware there's a comet that's supposed to be visible to the naked eye as we speak. Uh, that's right. It's, it's right at its peak right now, uh, yesterday and today. Yes, and it's called Comet Le Leonard. Leonard, uh, yeah. uh, With the designation C-2021. That's, uh, sorry, A-A-102, yeah, 2021. That's correct. And, uh, well, it's completely cloudy, but our, our telescopes are actually looking at it. So, yes. That's why it's good to have remote telescopes and then you can take pictures of them from, from remote sites, yeah. <laughs> but you're absolutely right, yes. You're right. Do you have a remote telescope? Sorry, what? Do you have a remote telescope? Yes, well, I work for a company called iTelescope, which is in Australia, like iPhone is iTelescope. And um, we rent out telescopes, right? So yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm lucky I get to use the best telescopes there are in Chile, in Australia, in um, North America, and in Spain, and so on, because we rent out these telescopes. So you can, you can rent these telescopes, and then you can take pictures of the comet with that, you know, with fairly easy way. That's, that's what I teach. That's my other, prof that's my profession at the moment. I teach how to do these things, right? So. <clears throat> Debbie is asking what months you were in, what months you were in Dutch Harbor. Yes, the best time is February and March to, to go there, February and March. Um, so now upcoming would be a good time. Um, I don't know what the situation with COVID is, uh, one would have to find out, but February and March are the best times. Um, yeah, it's not the tourist place, right? It's, it's an industrial place and you have to um, be a bit patient and get get around. And also you have to have lots of time because we couldn't get there for three or four days because the problem is if the planes don't fly, you come into a queue, a standby queue, right? And you sit in a standby queue with all kinds of other things. And then there's internal politics with the airlines. It's, it's very different, right? So then you have to stop bribing. So you get another seat and I don't know, whatever, right? <laughs> so it's, it's really crazy. So I just have to warn you, you know, you have to have lots of patience in Anchorage. You will eventually get there. But um, if you're lucky, you get there straight away. Two out of three times I got there straight away. But the last time was really, yeah, you just, I think it took us three days to get there. So you have to have patience, you know, so. <laughs> And be very nice to the airline people all the time. Talk to them and whatever, right? So <laughs> that's the way it works. <laughs> now, Jack, I see you've posted um, a YouTube thing here. Is that for comet watching? Jack, Jack yeah, that's a little YouTube video that kind of gives you the gist of uh, watching it. It's oh. apparently it's visible in the morning sky right now at about uh, forty-five minutes before sunrise. Oh, yes. but uh, of course we've got a little it's bit of cloud time cover. For me. So. Okay, so that that YouTube uh, thing will tell us when we can watch and exactly, yeah. Okay, thanks. Anyone else have any more questions or comments? I like the way you said some of that photography was so easy, Christian. Because I can't. <laughs> I it, it is it is it's not it's not difficult i i don't like to um honestly i absolutely do not like what i see on youtube where people make themselves to some kind of super experts it's really not difficult i try and tell everyone you know also when i teach astrophotography you can learn this in 15 minutes seriously in 15 minutes i'll get you to take a beautiful picture of the sky it's 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 really that simple so I'm, I'm, I'm exactly the opposite. I don't like that. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, there were some pretty fantastic photos. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, Christian. Um, thank you, thank you. Now going to uh, turn it over to our new lead social coordinator,